Hello everyone, welcome to American Government. We are starting with chapter one, a very good place to start, don't you think? All right, so let's get started with our first chapter here. So before we really get into uh, the nuts and bolts of chapter one, I want you to just think about these two questions here. Um, you know, maybe pause the video for a minute and think about the words that come to your mind or your answer to these questions. Um, if we were kind of in an in-person class, we would probably spend you know, about 10, 15 minutes going over these questions here. But number one, let's start with this. When you think about government and politics in the United States, what are your thoughts? What words are coming to your mind? There's no right or wrong answer here, right? So just what kind of connotations um, do you kind of associate with our government in the United States? So think about those words, what kind of thoughts are coming to your head? And as all of those words kind of rush through your brain, um, are those words, you know, are they kind of positive, negative, neutral? Um, and just, you know, maybe reflect on that for a minute or two. All right, number two, on a scale of one to 10, with one meeting not at all, and 10 meeting every second of the day, to what extent do you think the government has an impact on your daily life? Like day in, day out, getting up, the alarm goes off, take a shower, go to school, go to work, um, you know, make dinner go to bed um, when you're doing all that day in day out stuff scale of one to ten you know to what extent does the government play a role in your actions all right so i'll give you all a couple seconds think about those two questions we'll come back to well, we'll come back to the answer for number one throughout this whole class. Um, and the answer to number two, we'll come back to in a few moments here. All right, third question to get us started here today. Um, so many of us, right, maybe not all, but many of us are probably U.S. citizens taking this class here. Um, but not everyone was as lucky as we have been to have been you know born or perhaps some of you have already been naturalized as a u.s citizen um, every single year about seven hundred thousand to a million people go through the naturalization process in the united states and if you don't know naturalization is basically it's um, another word for becoming an immigrant becoming the citizen of a country so there are several steps to becoming a U.S. citizen, and not everyone who tries to become a U.S. citizen um, does eventually get through all of these steps. So what are all the steps? And as we're getting through this, you know, think about, could I make it through this process if we weren't you know, lucky enough to have already been born a citizen in our country? So step one, the paperwork, the forms, and you have to meet some requirements. Um, so for most people, you have to be a lawful, continuous resident of the US for at least five years. That means you haven't been out here getting arrested and put in jail in and out, um, and that you have lived in the US, um, like had a permanent residence here in this country for at least five years. So you've kind of proven yourself, right, for five years. Um, I've been an upstanding citizen, I've worked hard, I've paid taxes, um, you know, I haven't committed crimes, you know, I've proven my worth to at least fill out this paperwork. Uh, there are some exceptions, um, which I've put some links throughout the PowerPoint if you're interested in, you know, reading about some of the exceptions to the rules here. Number two, you have to pay the filing fees. Um, these can range, it depends who you are, your income level, where you're coming from, why you're coming, why you want to become a U.S. citizen, um, but they can range from zero dollars, you can, some, for some people it's free if you qualify, if you live below the poverty line, um, or if you're seeking political asylum, 
but for some people it can be upwards of four thousand dollars um, so if you're interested in breaking that down there's also a link there where you can kind of see who pays what the, determined by kind of who people are your occupation um, your income and your wealth and then once you've kind of done these two things you are going to turn in your naturalization application. Most people are going to fill out the form N-400, but there are many, many different forms um, determined, and you fill out those forms um, determined by who you are. Um, but most, majority of people are going to fill out the N-400. So I have a link there if you want to click into that and see um, some of the questions that they ask you on the naturalization form. Some of them are very basic. What's your name? What's your address? Where are you coming from? You know, um, your marital history, your children, um, income, occupation history, education, all that stuff that we're kind of used to on forms. Um, but as you can see on this screenshot here, there are also some more um, interesting questions as you can see uh, if you're reading that screenshot there. So they also get a little bit more intimate um, and try and get your your personal history um, in as much detail as they can. Alright, so now we've met the eligibility requirements, we've paid our filing fees, um, and the average person by the way pays about 380 to 450 dollars for their filing fee, so um, the 4,400 number is pretty rare. All right, and now we filled out our naturalization application and we send it in. Um, so for most people, um, that application doesn't even get processed for about nine months. Some people a little quicker, some people might wait longer than that. Um, but the average wait is about nine months, so hopefully in about nine months' time, then you will get a call um, from a naturalization agent. And if, if your application has been accepted, um, they are going to schedule an appointment with you. You'll come in, do your biometrics. Um, as you can see, you know, you'll do your fingerprints, they'll take your photo, um, they'll have you, you know, sign something so that we can have your signature on file and of course they're going to do a background check with the FBI and make sure all that stuff that you said on your application is indeed um, accurate. All right so now you've done step two if you clear through all that if your background check comes out then you can move to step three um, the naturalization interview. So now a federal officer is going to make another appointment with you. You're going to come in and there's several kind of components to this interview. First, they're kind of just going to go over your application, your background, if there's anything in there that you know, they want to ask more questions about, get a little more detail, this is where that will happen. Um, after you've gone through that, then most people will take an English test. There are some exceptions. Um, and again, there's a link on this slide if you want to read um, about certain exceptions that are made for the English and the civics test. But again, most applicants are going to have to take an English and a civics test. Um, the English test has three components, reading, writing, and speaking. But it's nothing like complex. They're not asking you to like, um, you know, not like those of you that are taking, you know, English in college, um, probably nothing even close to what you're required to do in, in a college level English class, right? It's very rudimentary. Just, you know, can you read, write, speak pretty basic, simple English and communicate with um, other people in English? Again, there are some exceptions to the English test, um, which you can read about there on that link that says exceptions and accommodations. Um, the civics test, there are again a few exceptions um, for people with um, who are differently abled um, or have mental um, disabilities are sometimes accepted from the civics test. Um, but that's kind of a case-by-case -case basis. But most applicants are going to have to take this test. 
Um, it asks you pretty important questions about U.S. history and government. So the USCIS, the U.S. Customs and Immigration Services, um, is a um, kind of an offshoot of our Department of Homeland Security, and they kind of conduct all of these this whole process of naturalization. Um, and if you go to their website, which again, I have provided for you, um, they have a practice civics test that's provided. And the real intention is um, for it to be a practice test for people who are trying to study and prepare for this interview. Um, so the practice test is 20 multiple choice questions and they are randomly populated every time you click the link. So I have the link for it down here all the way at the bottom um, where it says, you know, civics practice, practice test. Um, so if you click into that and you take it one time um, and then you reload the test another time, you're gonna be asked completely different questions. So they're randomly populated every time you click it and you get 20 questions. Um, however, side note, the actual civics test, if you're going in for this interview, um, the actual test is not a multiple choice test. The person is just going to sit there and ask you these questions and you have to know the answers right off the top of your head. There's no four choices for you to choose from. Um, during the interview, a federal officer is going to ask you, um, in the actual interview, they're going to ask you 10 questions but there are 100 possible questions that you have to be prepared, <clears throat> prepared for. So the government over here um, in that third bullet point here, you'll see that other list or link for civics questions and answers. So that's also provided by the USCIS um, and it lists out all of the, those 100 questions that you have to know the answers to if you want to do very, very well in your interview. Um, so the USCIS officer is going to ask you randomly 10 of those 100 questions. You don't know which 10 are going to pop up, so you have to know all of them. Um, and in order to pass, you have to get six of the 10 um, correct. If you don't pass the first time, you can try again, but you'll have to do the whole process all over. You'll, you can't just like take the test back to back you'd have to reschedule a whole new interview appointment and come back you know, whenever they have time for you, in a month, two months, six months. Um, but you do get two chances to pass these tests. Um, so my whole point in this is to lead us to this very last link on this slide. Um, so I hope we, when, before we even really get started in this class that you'll click on that link um, and or you can just search for, um, go on Google if the link doesn't work for you. However you're watching this, you can get on Google and just type in USCIS um, civics practice test and it should come up um, in your first search result. So if you click into that, you can take this actual you know, practice test to become a US citizen and you should go ahead, pause this video, go ahead and do that right now. It won't take you too long. Um, and see how you do, like just before we even get started um, with the material in this class. All right, so hopefully you just paused the video and you took your practice test. I hope you passed um, with at least a, a 60, because if you got a 60, that meant that you could move forward to step four. Step four means we passed all of those previous three steps, you, know, you did your, your application, um, you did your biometric screening, and you went in for your interview, passed your English and your civics test, and they have said, yes, you can become a U.S. citizen. So then they're going to call you, say, congratulations. Now you have to come in to a naturalization ceremony and kind of collectively take the oath of allegiance um, with every other you know, citizen um, who is, or with every other person who has been accepted to become a U.S. citizen this year. So now you'll go in physically to your naturalization ceremony and you will take the oath of allegiance, which is 
put your right hand up. Um, I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom or which I have heretofore been a subject or citizen, that I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by law, that I will perform non-combatant service in the armed forces of the United States when required by law, that I will perform work of national importance under civilian direction when required by law, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, so help me God. All right, so you are now a U.S. citizen. Congratulations. Um, and now we can get started with kind of the real nuts and bolts of chapter one here. So we've done our little intro to the intro. Yay. All right, so now we'll get started here. Um, if you are taking my class uh, on, on Blackboard, uh, then you can open up the chapter one link and find the chapter one um, worksheet. If you'd like to kind of fill that out as I go through this, that will help a lot when we get to quiz time at the end of the week. Um, I provide a worksheet every single for every single chapter that once you fill it out, you'll have a really good outline of what to expect on you know, the weekly quizzes and eventually you know, the midterm and the final. Okay, so let's get started here with um, some very, very broad, you know, questions and definitions. So way back, what was it on slide two of this PowerPoint, I asked you one of those two questions I asked you up front was on that scale of one to ten, to what extent does government you know, affect your daily life? Um, if you said one, uh, I would beg to differ, differ with you. Um, if you said, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, I've had some students say eleven, um, then, you know, I would probably be more apt to agree with you. So there's lots of stuff that we do day in, day out, just part of our mundane, routine lives that we don't even really realize that government, local government, state government, our federal government has had some sort of hand in. Um, so many of the things we do every single day um, are touched by government or brought to us by government, whether we realize it or not. Um, so just think about you know your day so far. What'd you do first? First thing I did was wake up. I didn't wake up spontaneously. Um, it's a work day, right? If I were if it were up to my own devices, I'd probably sleep till nine. But no, I had to go to work. So I woke up to an alarm clock. Um, my alarm this morning went off at 6.15. But why was it 6.15 and not 5.15, right? Because of daylight savings time, right? If we were four months ago, um, the light of day when I woke up today would have been 5.15. But no, it was 6.15. Um, so just, and daylight savings time, by the way, that was passed by the U.S. Congress, okay? That was a law that was passed in 1966, um, the Uniform Time Act. So just even what time it is um, and how bright or dark it is outside according to the time is itself kind of brought to us by our government. Uh, so government affects everything around us, even your alarm clock um, and what time we think it is during the day. Also, all sorts of other things, where you go to school, if you go to public school or technical college or a public institution, um, that is partially funded by the government, state government, county government, city government, maybe partially the federally, federal government, what you eat. Um, what you buy at the grocery store, all of that has to go through the USDA. Um, 
if you take medicine, that's going to get cleared through the FDA. Um, how your tax money is spent. We don't really have a choice whether or not to pay taxes, but how it's spent determined by our government. What you do in your free time, you know, if you hunt or you fish, all that sorts of stuff. Um, we'll get into this in a little while. A lot of that is kind of regulated by um, our government. Who you can marry, at what age you can get married. Um, also determined by our government. We'll get into that in later chapters here. When you can drive, when you can smoke, drink, vote, etc. All of this is determined by our government. Um, so everything you do, the red lights you passed on your way to work or school this morning or breakfast or whatever you've done, um, the roads that you're driving on, you know, the potholes or lack of potholes, um, the stop signs, everything around us is in some way kind of um, imbued with some sort of government influence, whether we like it or not. All right, so let's move on to some basic definitions here. First, been using this word government. What is government? It is the means by which a society organizes itself and allocates authority like who does what and who's in charge of who um, in order to accomplish collective goals and presumably to provide benefits that the whole society needs. Now most governments are going to at least purport to have goals of prosperity, security, and safety. Um, and many governments will also provide benefits for their citizens. Um, determined by you know how economically well off they are. Um, there are definitely exceptions to this rule, but most governments um, try to provide education, health care, and at least basic infrastructure um, for their citizens. Now politics, on the other hand, which we will of course also get into quite a bit in this class, um, kind of happens within the government. So Politics we're going to define as the process of gaining and exercising control within a government for the purpose of setting and achieving particular goals, especially related to the division of resources within a nation. To put it another way, politics is the process of who gets what and how. And it also a big part of politics is involving which values government will support and which it will not. Third definition for today to get us started is civic engagement. So civic engagement just refers to citizen participation in the government. And especially, especially in a democracy, you kind of need citizens to be involved in their government at all levels, at the local level, the county, the city level, the state level, and the federal level. If citizens stop caring about their government or their fellow citizens, democracy you know, can become pretty weak and brittle. And in some, um, with some historical precedents can even you know fall away and become a different form of government which we'll get into um, so civic engagement plays a vital role in our politics we in a democracy we do have you know power to influence the policies that our pol that our representatives pursue um, the values that our government chooses to support what kind of programs are granted funding, how much funding, how little funding, and who gets the final say in big decisions. So some examples of civic engagement can be, you know, it doesn't have to be like you're out there on the street holding a, you know, campaign sign, although it can be, but it can just be more simple stuff like I read about politics, I, you know, watch the news, I you know, follow some people on TikTok who keep me updated on what's going on in the world. Um, or I listen to news reports. 
I discuss politics with my friends or my family or my um, fellow students. I watch debates during political season. Um, I donate money to you know politicians that I like or political causes that I support. Um, or you can you know go a step further and get a little more active and volunteer to promote a candidate. You know when it's voting day or early voting and you see those people out there on the street holding the sign saying vote for this person you know they are very civically engaged um just the act of voting itself is an uh, example of civic engagement protesting um, writing or calling your elected representatives these are all examples of civic engagement so it's a pretty broad range of things you can do to kind of stay engaged with your government Now in the US, um, our democratic government works kind of hand in hand with our capitalist economic system. Um, and they affect each other and the goods and services that we rely on to kind of exist in, in our day in day out worlds um, relies on kind of a symbiotic relationship between our democracy and our economic system. So there are, we're going to go over three different types of goods that we kind of encounter and consume um, within our society. So first, we're going to look at private goods. These are the ones that when you think of like consumer goods, you're probably you know, thinking of when you go to Walmart or Target or um, wherever you go, Trader Joe's, I don't know, um, Aldi. Um, these are the things that you are buying. You're buying private goods, um, food, clothing, housing. All of these are provided by private businesses. And in return, they earn a profit, right? That's if you're taking economics 101, um, the whole point of capitalism is to earn a profit. Businesses won't stay in business if they don't do so. Um, so private goods are goods and services provided by, you know, kind of private businesses who earn a profit. Um, now, in an ideal world, right, in this ideal um, capitalist society, people could purchase whatever they need in whatever quantity they wanted. But, of course, we all live in reality and we know that not everyone has the means to purchase those complete necessities of life. Lots of people in our country live in poverty um, or near the poverty line, and a lot of people can't afford to buy the basics, food, clothing, housing, and health care. So there, the government kind of steps in to kind of support the private marketplace. Um, so the government provides um, public goods to us. These are goods and services that are available to everyone in, in our society without charge. And I should say without direct charge. Because um, there is a charge, but it's not really tit for tat. So, for example, um, one example of public goods would be national security, like our military, our police, and our fire departments when your house is being broken into and you call the police um, and you're you know frantic scared you want help need help um, you're on the phone with the dispatcher you're like oh my gosh my house is being broken into help me help me um, the dispatcher doesn't say oh yes yes ma'am yes sir um, just let me get your uh, credit card number because you're going to have to put a $500 deposit before I, you know, send a police, um, policeman or woman or person out to your house. No, they don't do that, right? They're, no, they're, you call 911, tell them what's going on, the emergency, and hopefully you'll have a police car pulling up to your house ASAP. They aren't going to take your credit card or deny you service because you can't pay um, some sort of deposit. Same thing with our military and our fire departments, right? So there's no direct charge for these services. We do pay for them kind of collectively via our state, um, local, and federal taxes, but um, 
you know, when it comes to like the immediate service, there's no direct charge that we are like forced to pay if we want the service of protection or security. Um, another example of public goods are, you know, K through 12 public education. You know, children um, in our country are kind of entitled in a way to, you know, free public education. Again, if you've gone to public school, you know, your parents aren't paying a bill every year for you to go to school. The society as a whole, we all pay taxes um, to, again, our local, our state, our federal government, and in exchange, uh, public education is provided for every child in this country. Uh, public transportation. Now you might pay a small fee to like get on the bus or the subway, um, but it's relative, it's subsidized by the government. The fee that you pay to get on the bus or the subway is a lot cheaper than it would be if it was just a private business. If any of you have taken like a Greyhound bus versus, you know, your local city bus, you know that difference in the fee scale. Um, and infrastructure, of course, like roads, bridges, highways, um, even like red lights, filling potholes, stuff like that. Um, we pay taxes and then the government tries, hopefully, to uh, maintain uh, a well-functioning infrastructure for us. Mail service, this is actually a constitutional right, which we'll get to next week. Um, but that is also, you know, we don't pay our... Um, United States post office like a fee every year that's again something that we indirectly pay for through our taxes um, and then of course for all those people who can't afford all those basic necessities in the private marketplace for food housing and health care um, our government does have uh, many different programs um, that people who live in, at, or near the poverty line can um, utilize to help pay for those basic necessities of life. Now the third type of goods we are going to look at here, third and final, are common goods. So these are goods that are
All right, so we got through our three types of goods. Now we're gonna move on to our next subject here. Um, we're gonna look at four kind of broad types of government. Hopefully this is fairly familiar to most of you. Um, the first one we'll look at is a monarchy. Um, this is, of course, the form of government that we threw off after the, the Declaration of Independence and the Revolutionary War. So a monarchy um, consists of a, an elite-driven form of government. That means only very special, rich, um, privileged people are going to have positions of power in this kind of government. Um, it usually involves one ruler, usually a hereditary ruler, holding political power. And hereditary meaning, you know, it's kind of passed down through the family line. Now, some monarchies are limited by law or a constitutional monarchy. For example, in um, England, yes, they have, you know, the king or the queen of England, um, but they also have, you know, the British Parliament, which is an elected legislature, kind of like we have, um, and they make laws and get into debates, and there's all sorts of political parties fighting with it, each other, just like we have. Um, of course, the one big difference is any law that they pass doesn't actually go into effect until the king or the queen signs their name to it. Um, all right, and then there's other monarchies. For example, um, King Salman of Saudi Arabia, who holds kind of more absolute and unrestricted power. They don't have to kind of work together with an elected legislature the way that... Um, you know, the British king or queen does. All right, second form of government here is an oligarchy. This is an elite-driven form of government as well. Um, only here it's not necessarily hereditary uh, or passed down through a family line. Uh, it more often, being elite, will be defined by your uh, participation and membership and commitment to a particular political party. Um, and usually in an oligarchy, one political party kind of holds all of the political power. Um, so for instance, today, you know, if you um, have read about China, um, they of course are a Chi um, communist country and the kind of <clears throat> powerful party in China is the CCP, or the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and typically, you're only really allowed to vote, um, hold any kind of public office, um, and really have power in any major business if you are a member of the CCP. If you are a dissident or have spoken out against the party, um, or have tried to run against any powerful figure or speak against a powerful figure in the CCP, you probably don't have um, very much power in, uh, in that country. Third type of government is totalitarian. This is when a government kind of considers itself more important than the citizens. Like the citizens as individuals are almost meaningless. It's the collective whole of the country, the government, that really um, drives the day. So this form of government um, oftentimes aims to control almost every aspect of a citizen's life. There's a lot of surveillance, um, a lot of control is exerted over um, the people in these countries. And of course, individual rights are very, very limited because you're not even really viewed as an individual. Um, opposition, criticism is definitely not allowed, um, and though totalitarianism is fairly rare today, on a large scale at least, one prime example would be um, in North Korea. That brings us to the subject of this course, um, uh, democracy. So democracy is a government in which political power, and um, by that we mean influence over institutions, leaders, and policies, political power rests in the hands of the citizens. So there's two kind of broad types of democracy, however. 
Um, the first type we kind of saw in ancient Greece. Um, this would involve citizens participating directly in making government decisions. So we call it direct democracy. Um, so in direct democracy, all of the people in a society would come together to debate and vote for or against all proposed laws. Every single law that got passed in our country, if we had a direct democracy, we would all have to leave work or leave school, go drive to the polling place, probably every single day, maybe multiple times a day, to cast our ballot for or against a law. Um, so if they want to raise the tariffs um, with, on, I don't know, Brazilian coffee, um, most people in our country probably aren't very educated on tariffs or what a tariff is or what a range of a normal tariff should be and why or why not, you know, would we want to raise the tariffs on Brazilian coffee? Um, so direct democracy in a country as large as ours probably isn't very uh, realistic. Um, can you imagine having to go into the polling place every single day to vote for or against a law? Um, most of us probably wouldn't even show up. So direct democracies, they're more effective and efficient kind of on a small scale, and we'll come back to this in a later chapter. There are um, some states in our country that on a more local level do try to implement direct democracy um, in kind of local elections or at the local or county level or even sometimes the state level with like referendums. Um, and we'll come back to that in, uh, in another chapter later this semester. But by and large, when it comes to our federal government, our national government, we are not a direct democracy. We have things to do, babies to take care of, or kids to take to school, or we go to school ourselves, or we got work. Um, you know, we don't have time to be voting and researching every single piece of legislation that um, goes through our um, government. So because of that, we actually have um, what's called a democratic republic or a representative democracy. So citizens in our country, especially at the federal or national level, we don't govern directly. Instead, we, every two years, four years, we elect, six years, um, elect representatives. And hopefully we elect somebody who we kind of like, who reflects our values um, to some extent, who we trust to make good decisions on our behalf. And we send them off to Washington or the capital of your state or you know, the government center in your city or county. Um, we elect those people and we trust them to act on our behalf and go pass laws that hopefully we will agree with and will benefit us. So those are the people who have to show up and actually vote for or against laws. We don't do that necessarily, um, especially at the national level. So U.S. citizens, we vote to elect our Congress members, the president, the vice president, um, our governors, our mayors, our town councils, school board members. And again, we kind of entrust them to make those day-to-day -day decisions when they vote on legislation, and hopefully they do it in our um, interest. So most representative democracies favor majority rule. That means, let's take like the U.S. Senate. There's 100 members of the Senate. If 51 members of the Senate vote for a bill, then the bill is going to pass because that's a majority, right? That's more than half of the Senate. But that doesn't mean that the other 49 members of the Senate are then put in jail um, and become political dissidents and we you know, send them out of the country. No, because we in the United States respect minority rights. Even if you are not part of the majority, um, or if you disagree with the way the majority voted, we still respect um, the 
positions and values of minorities in our country, even if we disagree or don't like the uh, positions that they take. And this is a pretty crucial aspect of a well-functioning democracy. All right, so we've gone through our three types of goods, our four types of government, and now we're gonna look very kind of quickly at two broad um, theories within political science, the pluralist theory or the elitist theory. So we will start with the pluralist theory. Um, it's very, um, to me, kind of something to strive for, an ideal theory that, you know, hopefully, um, you know, we step by step can get to one day. Um, political power, if you kind of fall within this theory, political power rests with competing interest groups who share influence in the government. And within kind of pluralist theory, there's an assumption that every single citizen in our society has the ability and opportunities to get involved in the political system and engage with our government. People in our society who have similar interests have the freedom and ability to form groups, to organize, to make their desires known to politicians. And the view here is that government policy is formed by way of negotiating with all these different interest groups with competing interests. And politicians, of course, they want to keep their jobs. Um, so they respond to the concerns of all of their citizens. So the key to pluralist theory is kind of this view that like all of us are equal. We all have an equal ability to contribute and have a say in the political process. Now, when it comes to voting, although, well, there are some exceptions to this, which we'll get to um, in our voting chapter, but theoretically, when it comes to voting, um, all U.S. citizens 18 and up, um, with some exceptions in some states, uh, have the ability to vote for their public officials. So maybe pluralist theory, when it comes to voting, has some, um, some merit. Of course, not if you're... Um, a felon or some other exceptions as well, but we'll get into that in a, a later chapter. All right, on the other hand, um, the opposing kind of theory within political science is elite theory. And this one kind of assumes that in our society, there's a group of elite citizens, rich, privileged, more powerful um, people in our society and this group of elite citizens is really in charge of the government. They really have kind of the most influence over what happens or doesn't happen. Um, and in comparison, while other citizens might try to have a say or form interest groups, um, they in comparison to that elite group don't have uh, as much power or influence. Um, so kind of the sidebar is wealthy, can kind of use their power to control the nation's economy um, or other laws or legislation that is passed or not passed in such a way that others who are not as powerful or wealthy or connected um, cannot advance in um, ways that would benefit them. So here's some quote unquote fun facts for you, um, kind of piggybacking on the elite theory. Um, one third of US presidents have attended Ivy League schools. All five of the most recent US presidents attended Ivy League schools and eight of the current nine Supreme Court justices attended either Yale or Harvard Law School. 94% um, of the House of Representatives, 99% of the Senate has at least a bachelor's degree. That's compared to about 39% of the general public in the U.S. 75% of Congress are non-Hispanic whites compared to 59% of the general public. 
28% of Congress are women compared to 51% of the general public. 2% of Congress identify as LGBTQ plus compared to 7% of the public. 88% of Congress members identify as Christian compared to 63% of the public. And 39% of Congress members are millionaires compared to only 9% of the general public. So does that matter, right? Um, some of you might say, no, it doesn't matter. Just because somebody is wealthy um, or male or well-educated or white, um, that doesn't necessarily mean they're only going to pass legislation that you know, only benefits wealthy, well-educated, white male people. Um, and that's true. That is, this is true. Um, but many others kind of also argue that... Um, you know, the way that we live, our backgrounds, our race, our, you know, gender, um, our uh, sexual orientation, our education background, our socioeconomic class, those things have an effect on your outlook on life, right? Um, so, for instance, right, 40 percent of Congress members send their children to private school. But that's only true for 10% of the people in this country. Um, so that's kind of out of kilter. Uh, if, you know, what, two-fifths of Congress, they maybe have never seen a public school or gone to a public school. Their children don't go. Um, you're maybe not aware of a lot of the trials and tribulations that our public education system, you know, goes through. The lack of funding, you know, the lack of new textbooks or, you know, up-to-date technology, you know, peeling paint off the walls, etc. Uh, these are things that many people in government maybe don't even see or are not aware of. And it's not that they're, like, trying to ignore it, but they just have never seen it. Um, and so some argue that, yes, having more diversity in terms of, you know, class, race, sexuality, gender, you know, profession, education status, that maybe that would perhaps be a good thing for the country and the laws that get passed or don't get passed. Um, because the life, the kind of day-to-day, -day, you know, experiences of a lot of Congress members doesn't necessarily reflect the experiences of you know, most kind of average Joe or average Jane Americans. All right, so we're going to kind of jump back to civic engagement here. Um, so don't let that whole elite theory, you know, make you apathetic. Don't get cynical. Um, because, as I said, you know, there's one thing we really do have in the United States that many other people around the world do not have. And that is, well, we have a lot of things, which we'll get into in the next few chapters, um, like our Bill of Rights, for instance. But for now, um, we do have a vote. Um, and we get our vote and we get to every, you know, two, four, six years have a say in who is representing us. Now, before we really get into a lot of that, I want to take a little sidebar and give you a, um, a look at this political scientist. His name was Robert Putnam, and he wrote, he wrote a really renowned book in back in the year 2000, before some of you were born, I'm sure, um, but it was called Bowling Alone. And in the book, he kind of argued that civic engagement in our country was declining um, and because of that, we had weakened social capital in our country. And he defined cap social capital broadly as the collective value of all social networks and the inclinations that arise from these networks to do things for each other. And by social networks, we're not talking about Facebook. We're talking about like face-to-face, -face, you know, communication, interaction, with other people in our neighborhood, in our community, on a regular basis. 
people who we can rely on, people who we know intimately over time. Uh, so social networks kind of includes a sense that you're part of something bigger than yourself. It provides us with an outlet where we don't feel so isolated. Um, and the more social networks that we are part of, we tend to have a greater concern for you know, our community, the collective good, willingness to help others, the ability to trust and work with others um, to find common solutions to common problems. So before I go forward um, with some excerpts from his book, just think about um, you know, where you live. Do you know your next door neighbor? Have you ever talked to your next door neighbor? Maybe you give a wave um, every now and then if you, if you cross paths with them. Uh, even if you wave at them sometimes, do you know their name, their first name? Do you know their last name? <laughs> do you know if they have children? Do you know where they work? Um, do you know their day in, day out struggles? Right? Many of us today, we don't even know our next door neighbor. We're also isolated um, in our own kind of personal bubbles, um, both physically and kind of virtually. Um, for instance, you know, back in the day, right, you could go next door and ask your next door neighbor for um, a roll of toilet paper if you had run out or, you know, an egg if you were making a cake and you forgot to buy eggs and you're halfway through the recipe and oh my gosh. Um, and there was kind of a sense of reciprocity, like I'll give you a roll of toilet paper today and when I need a roll of paper towels in a couple weeks, I'll come knocking on your door. But today, you know, if you knock on somebody's door, somebody's either going to like turn on their ring camera and be like, get out of here. Uh, I'm calling the police, right? So there's this sense of this lack of trust that's kind of developed over time in our country. And this is really what Robert Putnam was kind of putting his finger on back in 2000. And mind you, this is before the iPhone, before you know social media as we know it today. Um, so he was noticing this trend before any of that stuff even happened. So, his main kind of thesis in the book was that, um, especially since the 1980s, he noticed that Americans' membership in kind of face-to-face, -face, regular, you know, social groups that meted regularly had transformed. People were not joining groups anymore, at least not in the same way. So he was looking back kind of throughout the 1900s and said Americans really throughout you know, 1900 to 1980 were very involved in their communities, whether it was, as the title of the book says, you know, bowling leagues or church groups or unions or PTAs or volunteering locally, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. And he noted that participation in all of those, what he called like community building organizations had fallen, it, not just in one city or one state, or in one particular type of group that like across the board, people stopped joining groups kind of almost very abruptly in the 80s and kind of continued throughout the 90s. And instead of joining kind of these small local active groups, people started to join these larger kind of amorphous, impersonal groups that didn't really require any regular interaction, any real like face-to-face, -face, you know, communication. <clears throat> it didn't really take up our, our time or energy. So Putnam argues we were becoming insulated, more and more individualized, um, more and more private, and he kind of links that to a downturn in our civic engagement, which of course, as I noted before, is pretty critical for a well-informed and thriving democracy. And I like this quote from Robert Putnam down here at the bottom. If you don't know, those of you that are younger, Big Brother used to be like a really popular reality show um, in the like the early 2000s. Um, but you can fill in, you know, Big Brother with whatever popular reality show there is on Netflix today. Um, 
But he said, this is his quote, none of the people watching Big Brother will bring you chicken soup if you get sick, right? Um, so if you're part of, let's say you're part of like a Reddit thread um, or a Reddit support group um, and you get on Reddit and you read other people's experiences and stories and it makes you feel better and maybe you comment on something. Um, but like exactly like Putnam is saying here, um, and you feel supported maybe by those people to a certain extent uh, or validated. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you have, you know, the flu and you can't get out of bed um, and you, you know, need some soup and crackers um, or a glass of water, you know, none, you can't get on Reddit and say, hey, somebody bring me, some, somebody help me, I'm sick. Those people might not even live in your city or your state or even the same country as you right so you can't depend on them in that same way that you could with a lot of those people um say in your bowling league like putnam is kind of um hearkening to here so i have um several different quotes here from his book so i'll just read through these for you so you can get a little idea of um of what kind of he was getting at. And if you are you know, in my class on Blackboard, you can go into chapter one into the supplementary readings link. And I have a link to chapter one from his book, um, Bowling Alone, in there if you want to kind of read the whole chapter. So here are uh, a few little quotes from his book. So this first quote kind of puts it kind of puts the whole book into like a couple sen few sentences. Um, the most whimsical yet discomforting bit of evidence of social disengagement in contemporary America that I have discovered is this. More Americans are t bowling today than ever before, but bowling in organized leagues has plummeted in the last decade or so. Between 1980 and 1998, the total number of bowlers in America increased by 10%, while league bowling decreased by 40%. The rise of solo bowling threatens the livelihood of bowling lane proprietors because those who bowl as members of leagues consume three times as much beer and pizza as solo bowlers, and the money in bowling is in the beer and pizza, not the balls and shoes. The broader social significance, however, lies in the social interaction and even the occasionally civic conversations over beer and pizza that solo bowlers forego. Couple more little excerpts from his book. Um, in recent years, social scientists have framed concerns about the changing character of American society in terms of the concept of social capital. By analogy with notions of physical capital and human capital, tools and training that enhance individual productivity, the core idea of social capital theory is that social networks have value. Just as a screwdriver, physical capital, or a college education, human capital, can increase productivity, both individual and collective, so too social contacts affect the productivity of individuals and groups. Whereas physical capital refers to physical objects and human capital refers to properties of individuals, social capital refers to connections among individuals, social networks and the norms of reciprocity and trustworthiness that arise from them. In that sense, social capital is closely related to what some have called civic virtue. The difference is that social capital calls attention to the fact that civic virtue is most powerful when embedded in a dense network of reciprocal social relations. A society of many virtuous but isolated individuals is not necessarily rich in social capital. And one more. In each domain, we shall encounter currents and cross currents and eddies, but in each we shall also discover common powerful tidal movements that have swept across American society in the 20th century. The dominant theme is simple. For the first two thirds of the 20th century, a powerful tide bore Americans into ever deeper engagement 
in the life of their communities. But a few decades ago, silently, without warning, that tide reversed and we were overtaken by a treacherous rip current. Without at first noticing, we have been pulled apart from one another and from our communities over the last third of the century. The impact of these tides on all aspects of American society, their causes and consequences, and what we might do to reverse them is the subject of the rest of this book. Section three explores a wide range of possible explanations from overwork to suburban sprawl, from the welfare state to the women's revolution, from racism to television, from the growth of mobility to the growth of divorce. So those are some of like the variables that he points to um, to suggest why maybe this <clears throat> falling away um, or diminishment of civic engagement um, and joining groups in general has ha or had happened in the United States. So it's a very good, very renowned book in political science. Um, if you have time, I suggest you know go to your library or get on Amazon and <clears throat> read the whole book, or for free you can just you know get on Blackboard and read um, chapter one. All right, now we are getting there. We're going to get back to civic engagement um, and kind of finish up this lecture here. So as we already defined, civic engagement involves a broad range of different activities you can take part in. Some of it's just turning on the radio and listening to the news or opening up TikTok and reading a news story. That's civic engagement. Um, or you can do some more kind of intense um time-consuming uh, stuff as well. So forms of in individual engagement, you know, stay informed, um, write, contact your representatives, file a complaint with your city council. Hey, there's a pothole on this street. Y'all better fill it. I pay my taxes. Um, responding to public opinion polls, writing a blog, um, commenting on a political story voting, of course, attending rallies, donating money, and signing petitions. Also forms of group engagement that you can um, take part in if you want to be civically engaged, um, volunteering for a campaign, engaging in fundraising efforts, so not just donating money, but trying to get other people to donate money, um, handing out bumper stickers or buttons, helping people to register to vote, registration drives, um, or going door to door, like helping people register, driving people to the polls to vote who maybe don't have a car um, or a license, um, joining an interest group, we'll have a whole chapter on interest groups later, um, or joining a protest march or a demonstration. Now, political activity is not the only form of civic engagement. You can be involved with your community and other people in our society and our democracy um, and not have to get super political about it. Um, and younger people, when it comes to civic engagement, are a lot more apt to take part in these kinds of activities because politics kind of turns them off, which we'll get to in a second. Um, so young people and many other people um, also can get civically engaged by doing stuff that's more kind of locally oriented, you know, taking care of a community garden, um, you know, building a house with Habitat for Humanity, cleaning up trash in your local river, your community, uh, helping to deliver meals to the elderly, you know, volunteering to walk dogs for the Humane Society. Uh, or tutoring kids in after-school programs. So most of us um, U.S. citizens, we do engage in some kind of political activity, um, though as kind of um, the Bowling Alone book Robert Putnam was hinting at, most of our engagement involves, you know, non-personal activities that don't really require much interaction with other people, um, like, you know, donating money or signing a petition um, or a GoFundMe page, right? Um, and studies show, um, particularly there was a study from Harvard that came out that showed that Americans 18 to 29 
are less likely to become in kind of these involved in these traditional forms of um, political engagement. However, you know, significantly more of them were involved in these kind of local community service programs. So why are younger Americans less likely to be involved in traditional political kind of organization or involvement um, or civic engagement? So first thing is American politics has become increasingly partisan and ideological over the past 50 years. If you turn on the news, you know, it's all this red versus blue and comments on social media. Are you on the red team or the blue team? And if you're on the other team, then I hate you. Um, if you win, then I lose. You know, it's a lot of like us versus them mentality um, and not so much of like a we the people way of thinking so, um, as much anymore. So we refer to this as committed partisanship, which is kind of this tendency to almost like a football game. Like, you know, I am a fan of this team and every other team, you know, go to hell, uh, so to speak. So committed partisanship is kind of bringing that football team mentality to our politics and our government. Um, it's that tendency to identify with and to support often without question, a political party. So you decide that, you know, you're a Democrat and then you kind of just don't even question all of the laws or um, policies or values that the Democratic Party, you know, is proposing over time. You just have decided you are a Democrat and you will always vote with the Democrats. And on the other side, same thing. You know, I decided I was a Republican and, um, you know, I'm going to agree with Republicans no matter what they do. This is committed partisanship. And studies show that most Americans under age 30 are not identifying with either of these political parties anymore. Some of them are, but most of them are actually um, labeling themselves as independents. And here is a little chart that graphs this um, movement toward independent political affiliation over time. So this is tracking from 1992 to 2022. And you can see it's kind of, um, it shows you each different generation here. So on the bottom, the green line is the silent generation, people who were born from 1928 to 1945. You know, relatively few of them identify as independents. Um, in 2022, only 26%, so one out of every four. Uh, our next generation up are the baby boomers, from born from 1946 to 64. Um, even for them, less than half of baby boomers identify as independents. In 2022, 30, about one in three. Uh, then we got the kind of dashed blue line is Gen X. Those are people born from 1965 to 1980. And a larger percentage of them identify as independent, but they never even get past the 50% mark. Um, I think the highest looks like maybe about 45 or 46% um, right there in 2012. But in 2022, about 44% identified as independent for Gen X. And then you see right at the top, um, the generation, the youngest generation, who is identifying as independent more than any other age group, which is um, our millennial generation, 1981 to 1996. And you'll see in, it's kind of been a steady trajectory upward, right, from 42% in 20, 2002 to 52%, more than half of millennials in 2022 identified as independent. Um, we don't have any um, Gen Z, a Gen Z line quite yet, but I'm pretty sure, you know, they'll start tracking Gen Z's affiliations uh, probably this year, if not, you know, in 2026. Um, kind of related to the last two slides, um, you know, a lot of young Americans are just kind of turned off by, you know, how the two political parties are so, and, um, 
in such a state of animosity toward each other, they like, hate each other, um, or at least it's presented that way to us in the media. Um, we'll get more into that in chapter eight. Um, but also that um, what's associated with each political party are kind of these diehard, you know, ideologies that are firm. Um, and a lot of young people, you know, kind of don't necessarily see things black and white. They <clears throat> maybe see more gray area, or maybe they agree with some things that the Democrats do, but they also agree with some things the Republicans do. So they just don't really find a home, so to speak, in either party. Another reason, um, this may be, I would say, has slightly changed recently, but it's still true to some effect, um, is that young Americans tend to feel that political candidates don't really talk to them. They don't tackle issues that they care about, right? Young people don't care about property taxes or estate taxes or Medicare funding, um, etc. Right, but you'll find if there's ever a candidate who comes out there and does talk to, in, to an issue that they care about, like um, yeah, um, student loan debt, right, or forgiving student loan debt, or making college more affordable, um, or if they're talking about you know issues of um, criminal in our criminal justice system or things like that that are our environment and climate change, those are things that young people tend to be more um, enthusiastic about. But oftentimes, politicians don't necessarily pay attention to those issues. Um, and there's also a pretty well-studied correlation um, certainly between education and voting, but also slightly between wealth and voting or political engagement. Um, so many studies have shown that people who are wealthier and more educated tend to be more politically involved. And people who are more politically involved and more educated and wealthy tend to hold very intense preferences when it comes to their political positions, meaning they probably are more partisan um, and tend to hold very strong and consistent feelings over time about specific issues. On the other hand, young people, well, maybe one day they will be wealthy and highly educated, but they're still in that process. They're going to school, they're going to class, um, they're taking their finals and their midterms and studying and working their part-time jobs or, um, or full-time jobs, you know, building that career. <clears throat> and so because of all that, they've got other stuff they're worried about. They're less likely to be politically involved. And also kind of as a correlation, they um, hold what we call latent preferences or political preferences that aren't necessarily like deeply held yet and they may even change over time. So we're getting to our last two slides here. Um, so this graph comes to us from the US Census Bureau. They put this out and it tracks, um, again, kind of voting rates by age group over time going from 1980, this one goes to 2016. Um, and you can see, again, kind of similar to the last graph we were looking at, there's a bit of a difference here um, in terms of age groups and um, their voting patterns. So let's start at the top. The top is our 65, the orange line is the 65 plus um, population in the US. You can see that they typically vote um, at about you know 70 percent or more of the 65 plus population is going to show up at the voting booth um, if we go down an age group 45 to 64 the green line um, they also vote at fairly high percentages you know the highest here is what probably about 75 percent three out of four showing up to the voting booth what's a low maybe around 68 69 um, if you look at the 30 to 44 age group, the blue line, 
um, pretty moderate um, voter turnout, but they still show up um, pretty reliably, upwards around of like 60% or more. And then you know, go down to the 18 to 29, our young voter line down here, the red one at the bottom. Um, so young people do have kind of the lowest voter turnout over time. Um, kind of lingering from what a high of about 50 uh, or so a little upwards of 50 to a low of you know close to 40 percent now there's one interesting exception in here one notable um, thing you may notice a notable thing you may notice anyway um, so if you look at the 2016 election you may remember who was running in 2016. We had um, Hillary Clinton versus Trump, right? And if you look at these four lines, the orange line, the green line, the blue line, and the red line, and kind of compare that to the previous election, 2012, you'll see the only line that went up from 2012 to 2016, um, so the only increase in voter turnout happened in the 18 to 29 age group. Um, and that continues, get to my last slide here, because this ends in 2016, 